Good morning. Thank you for tuning in for our Sunday service. I want to bring the word of the Lord out of 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'm going to read a few scriptures with you, starting with verse 1. It said, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out yet, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. I'm going to back up just a little bit and give you a little bit of information leading up to this story. Samuel was a very unique child, I guess you would say. His mom had been praying for a son was unable to have a child. And she went to the temple and Eli actually ministered to her and prayed with her to have a son. And she did. She conceived a son. And she told the Lord, if you'll give me a son, I will give this son back to you. And, and she did those very things. As soon as the little boy was weaned from the mother, she took him back to the temple. And Eli raised him there uh, as the priest. He raised him and taught him the ways of, of, at that time, the tabernacle. And taught him the ways of the Lord. This in particular time, this in chapter 3, things was going just according to uh, everyday life. They had finished their duties for the day. They had laid down for the night to get some sleep in their usual places. But I, I found it kind of interesting when the Bible says that Samuel laid down where the ark of God was. Now, we know in this time the temple had not been built yet. Uh, we know that this was considered the tabernacle. There was a lot of curtains. You can go back and, and read where Moses had established how this thing was set up. There was a lot of curtains, and they had to be folded a certain way, made out of a certain material. There was a lot of, of skins uh, that was in the temple, and it kind of set the, set the foundation for the temple to be built. And so the, the priest at the time would, would lay down and rest there at the tabernacle. Now... I had a few questions that popped up in just these few little verses. My first question was, in, chapter, in verse 1, it says that the word of the Lord was scarce in those days, and the visions was few. So I asked myself, Lord, why was the word so scarce? Why wasn't there many visions? I studied in a little bit deeper to find out that Eli's sons, who was raising up to be priests, uh, was defiling the tabernacle. They was doing things against the protocol or the rules, so to speak, that for, was for selfish gain. And they was defiling the tabernacle. And Eli, being the father, being the overseer, being the priest at the time, was allowing this to happen. So that was slowing down, maybe slowing down the progress, slowing down the communication, and slowing down uh, moving forward with the Lord. So then I asked myself, you know, sleeping... In the temple, that seems kind of odd to me. You know, I've read stories and I know that when they go into the Holy of Holies, that they would tie a rope around them because if they was unclean or impure in any kind of way, they could fall dead and they'd have to use the rope to pull them back out. Going into the Holy of Holies was a very uh, serious issue. It was, it was only the highest of priests was allowed to enter into there. And we find this boy resting, not necessarily where the ark was, but near it. Like I said, the temple wasn't set up yet. This was just the tabernacle. And so he was close to where the ark was. Why was he sleeping near the presence of God? You know, the ark was the presence of God. And I got to thinking, you know, it's because Samuel was brought here as a young child. This was a lifestyle for him. He ate, he slept, he studied, he worked. His whole life revolved around the presence of God. So much as when he laid his head down at night to rest, he was resting next to the presence of God. It was not a label for him that he was raising up to be a priest. It was a lifestyle that he lived. I got to thinking about that just a little bit and I turned over to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 through 27 where it similar it, there's some similarities in it and it talks about 
the relationship we have with Christ is very much like uh, the bride and the bridegroom. They can, it, it compares us to this. So I got to thinking, you know, I am married. And I am married where, regardless of where I go, regardless of what I do. When I go to work, I'm still married. When I file my taxes, I am married. When I go to Walmart or to the grocery store, I am married. When I stand in the pulpit to proclaim the word of the Lord, I'm married. So regardless of what's going on in my life, it doesn't change the fact that I am in a marital relationship with my wife. It made me think about that whenever we're talking about our relationship with the Lord or being in the presence of God. We are, it's like we are married. In other words, when you're at work, you are still a child of God. You are still a Christian. When you're at Walmart, you are still a child of God. You're still a Christian. When you're working on your car, you are still a child of God. You're a Christian. Just because things and roles and, th and situations come across our life does not change the fact that we are children of God and that we have a relationship with Him, a binding relationship with Him. We are now co-heirs with Christ. And it, that hit home to me because I think a lot of times I find myself so busy doing this or so busy doing that or so busy with just life in general. This sometimes that gets put on the back burner. Sometimes my recognition of the Lord's presence gets put on the back burner. Sometimes, you know, my attention to this word and the application of his word kind of gets put on the back burner because I'm busy with everyday life. Samuel was in a place to where his entire life revolved around the presence of God. I read in Galatians 2, 20 said, said that it says, I've been crucified with Christ, so no longer I live, but Christ lives within me. When we receive the gift of salvation, honey, it's no longer about us as an individual. It's about us as a relationship with me and Christ, you and Christ. It, there, there becomes a joining there, a relationship there. And that's what life becomes about. Amy, you're talking radical stuff this morning. You're wanting us to go around waving our Christian flags. And, no, I'm wanting us to get to a place to where we understand that our relationship with God exists regardless of where we're at. Regardless of what we're doing, you know, when I'm, when I'm on the internet or whether I'm uh, out and about, what, whatever I'm doing, just like I said, that I am still married, I'm also still a Christian. And that should go before me and that should be at the forefront of my mind. Similar to a marriage. If I walk around all the time and, and I don't let that realization that natural realization hit me that I'm married. Honey, you'll get in all kind of trouble. You'll get in all kind of trouble. And it's the same way with Christ. If we don't have the acknowledgement in our mind that we have a relationship with Him and we strive to where everything in our life contacts Him. We make a connection in every area of our life. Samuel was at a place where not only did he work teach, learn, understand, but he slept next to the presence of God. Luke 9 verse 23, if you want to hear Jesus' words, he says, if anyone should come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me daily. Daily. What an what a invitation to a profound relationship. To be able to walk with him daily. Samuel rested. You know, I've, I've come to realize that me being a busy person, and, and maybe you are as well. So we are so busy. Every minute of our day is just always uh, coming in contact, having to deal with, do, work, whatever. We're just busy. And... I get to a place where I'm so tired sometimes as soon as I sit down in the evening and just be like, oh, my day's finished. Well, I go straight off to sleep. I'm exhausted physically. I'm exhausted mentally. 
But you know, there's something on the inside of me that if I'm dealing with or if I'm struggling with some something, you know, sometimes I dream about it at night. My body and my mind is, so to speak, has shut down, but there's something on the inside of me still awake. And even if I, even when I rest, I wrestle. Samuel was at the place to where even when he rested, he rested next to the presence of God. My other question was, why did the Lord speak to Samuel and not Eli? If you read a couple verses down, you'll see that as Samuel was asleep, somebody started calling his name. Well, he thought it was Eli, so he ran out and he said, yes, what, you know, are you calling me? And Eli's like, no, I'm not calling you, boy, go back to sleep. So he did it a second time. Eli told him again, Samuel, I'm not calling you. Honey, go back to sleep. Go lay back down and go back to sleep. Well, then finally it registered to Eli, wait a minute. Somebody's calling him and it must be the Lord. So when he come back and he said, you know, did you call me? Eli said, listen, go back and lay down. And when they call you again, answer. And when he did, he went back, he laid down, they called, and the Lord called him. He answered the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, because Eli's the priest. Why did he choose to speak to Samuel and not Eli? Because he had a plan and he had a purpose. You know, I ask myself the question, if there was no more pulpits, if there was no more preachers, if there was no more televangelists, if there was no more worship on the radio, if there was no more pop-up devotions on our Facebook or pop-up devotions on the internet, if it was brought down to just me and the Bible that I have. Where would I be? Where would I be? Because, you know, the Lord spoke to Eli. The, the, he was the priest. He was the one that, that everyone got their answers from. If they needed something, they, they, he's the one that prayed. And in this situation, God didn't choose to speak to Eli. He wanted to speak to Samuel. What would happen if we was just left with ourselves and our word, the word of God that we have available to us? What would happen if somebody else didn't filter through and try to interpret? What would happen if we didn't turn on the radio and, and hear worship music pump and, and scriptures quoted on the radio? What would happen if... On social media, we didn't have all of these things. How devastating would it be to us? You know, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2 and 15, to study and show yourself approved. Colossians 3, 16 says, let the word dwell in you richly and to teach you to admonish others in wisdom. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in our heart to God. If that was all taken away, would we still have a word? If it was all taken away, would we still have a song in our heart? I'm really bad about, uh, I hum all the time. I, you know, a lot of people, I don't, I don't know um, if you hum or not, I'm a hummer. And so if I'm working or if I'm piddling or if I'm doing anything, a lot of times I'm, I'm humming and I don't even realize I'm doing it. And sometimes it's annoying to other people, but uh, I find myself humming. And even when I don't understand or realize that I'm doing it, it's like it's just inside of me and it just comes out without me knowing. And I'm not saying that bragging, I'm saying because I'm sure that you do the same thing. You know, whether you're working in the house or you're wor at work or, or you're just strolling along for a walk or whatever, sometimes there's a song that just pops up in your mind or in your heart and you're thinking about it. And sometimes you might sing a a little bit of it if all of these things was taken away from us would the song still be in our heart would the word still be in our heart 
Would we still long to dive in and to search for it? Because God didn't want to speak to Eli. He wanted to speak to Samuel. Samuel was just a young child. He was being raised up, but he wasn't there. He wasn't there yet. And God said, okay, you're ready. I need to, I need to tell you something. So how phenomenal is it that God chose to speak to Samuel on that personal level? So this morning I'm left with, I'm left with a bunch of questions and I know I've asked a bunch of questions, but I want you to ponder. I want you to think on these things. What would happen if we dedicated our lives and laid down our labels? What would happen if being a Christian was no longer a label? It wasn't a title. It wasn't about where you went to church or who you associated with. But we laid that label down and we dedicated our lives into a true relationship. What would happen? Then I thought, what would happen if there was nowhere, no one else to blame? If it was just me and God. You know, when Samuel laid down that night, the day was done. All the tasks had been performed. Everything was in order. Everything had shut down. The candle was burning. It was time to rest. What would happen if there wasn't anyone else to blame in our life? What would happen, you know, at night when the day's done, your work is finished, you finished all the tasks that had been laid out before you that day, and you lay down at night, and it's still, and it's quiet, and it's just you and God. There's no one else to blame for the issues, the circumstances, the situations. The word's been taken away. Let's say, let's say that all of the, the TV and the internet, the preachers, the pulpits, everything's gone, and it's just you and the word of God. In other words, there's no one else to blame. There's no other interpretations to blame. There's, there's no preachers to blame. There's no evangelists to blame. There's, there's no situations to blame other than you and God. How real would that relationship be? How real would it be when Samuel laid down that night and God spoke to him? He couldn't say, well, it wasn't my job to light the candles. He couldn't say it wasn't my job to sweep the floors. It wasn't my job to make sure that the curtains was in place right. It was him and the Lord. What would happen if there wasn't no one else to blame? Just us and God. What would our complaints be? What would our excuses be for not living for the Lord? What would the reason be that we don't live for Him daily. That we don't have a relationship with Him similar to a marriage that regardless of where we go or what we do or who we're around, we're the same. What would happen if we laid down quietly and listened and was still before the Lord? When Samuel laid down that night, it was quiet. It was still. You know, like I said earlier, I'll get busy in my life every day. This, that, this, that, go here, do this, listen to this, call this. My day's very hectic and very busy at times. And even my wife knows that if she wants to have a really serious conversation with me, wait till I lay down. What if we got to a place to where we can lay down in the presence of the Lord? And be still enough to hear him. Samuel could have been sleeping so hard that night that he missed the, missed the word of the Lord. But it woke him. And he answered. And if you read down in the last part of that chapter, you'll see that Samuel lived for him throughout his days. You know, there's something that happens... When we step into a relationship with the Lord and it becomes real to us, it's not something that we're taught. Okay, now look at Samuel. He was raised by Eli in the temple. Day in and day out, he learned all the aspects of what to do, what the will of God was, how to approach the people. He learned everything there was to know. He learned it. 
But that night, he experienced God. Experienced him. It became, a, it became very personal to him that night. You know, we may have been raised up in church, taught things, or you may be in a place to where you're just now learning. You've never been raised up in it. You're just now learning. I encourage you, my friend, to reach out into a place where you are experiencing a personal connection with God and not taking somebody's word for it. That you're reaching out and you're becoming active for the Lord and doing His will, not because of something that somebody has said, but because you felt something on the inside. What would happen? I'm going to tell you what would happen. Acts chapter 2 and 17 says, In the last days I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And even upon my servants and upon my handmaidens, I will pour out my spirit, saith the Lord. The Bible says in Psalms 34, 8, to taste and see that the Lord is good. He's wanting you to have a personal connection and experience. You know, I can tell you that an apple is good all day long. I can tell you that strawberries are good all day long. But until you taste it for yourself, it's just words. It's just something you've heard. I'm encouraging us this morning to step into a place where our relationship ignites something on the inside of us. That it's no longer something that we're just taught we should be. Or it's not something that we're taught we should do. But it's an encounter and it's an experience that changes our life. That changes the way we think. Changes the way we talk. Changes the places we go and the things that we do. And it changes our entire perspective, perspective on life. Talk's cheap. Y'all ever heard that? Talk's cheap. We can talk this thing to death. We like to do that. But actions speak so much louder than words. Matter of fact, the Bible says don't just be hearers, but be doers of the word. Because it's not just going to be what the word says. It's not going to be just what you say. But it's going to be how we respond to the word. Philippians 1.6 says confidence <laughs> that he has began a good work in us. That he's going to complete that. Have confidence in this. That if he began something in you, he's going to finish it out. He's not a person. Jesus is not a person that once we come in contact and we start a relationship with him. Honey, it's not a one-time introduction. I've met a lot of people for the first time and maybe never seen them again or heard from them again. This is not the type of relationship that Jesus is asking for. It's not the type of relationship that Jesus is longing for. Jesus is longing for a daily walk with him. Take up your cross daily. Be like Samuel. Let everything you do, let everything you are, let everything that you envision revolve around your relationship with Christ. If you're married, you'll understand that connection. Let everything in the life that you do revolve around your spouse. How does that work? Communication. Respect. Trust. Love. Several different aspects. If we're wanting to hear the voice of the Lord. If we're wanting to have a vision of things to come. And the plan and the purpose that he does have for us. My friend, we've got to get to a place to where it's personal. Because if not, everything everybody else does is going to hurt your feelings, make you mad. You know, people leave churches day after day after day and time after time after time because of something somebody said or something somebody didn't do. Or the way that somebody acted or, or this, that and the other. And you know, and I understand all these things. But that's not the reason to walk away from God. That's not the reason to lay down your relationship with the Lord. That, that your relationship with the Lord should not be t tied and solely focused on somebody else's response. It's all about you. It's all about me. And it's all about God. 
if we want to see the things that God has in store for us, if we want to be able to live with that full potential in Christ, we need to look at our relationship. Does our relationship reflect, have a reflection on the outside? Are we the same wherever we go? Is your talk the same wherever you go or whoever you're around? Samuel was at that place as a young child and he heard from the Lord. And when he had that personal experience, even though he was destined to be in that position, his mom dedicated him to the Lord in that position. When that real experience came, it changed Samuel's life. Because then instead of, I'm supposed to do this, it became, this is who I am. And I'm going to do this. And he was successful and he lived for the Lord all of his days. So I want to challenge you this morning. Where do you rest at? Because at the end of the day, when you get to that resting period and that resting place, sometimes that's who we really are. Because we take off everything else, all the other titles and positions and, and whatever we ha may have responsibilities fall away when we lay down at night and it's just you. When it's just you, do you rest near the presence of the Lord? Do you rest there? Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share your word and I pray, Lord, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice watching this video if they do not know you, if they do not have a personal relationship with you, Father, if they have not experienced you in a life-changing manner, Lord, I pray that they start seeking your face. I pray that their personal relationship starts to develop. They start hearing your word, seeing your word, reading your word, applying your word. Father, I pray, Lord, that you step into their life and into the situation that they're in and you make yourself known to them and give them the experience that they need to spark a relationship like they never have before. Father, I pray, Lord, that you allow us to take this word and apply it to our lives. Lord, that we can hear you. That we can live for you. Father, that being a Christian is what we title it. But having a relationship with you is who we are, not what we do. Father, I thank you for the word that was given to me many, many years ago that said, Amy, don't, don't do love, but be love. It's not about what we do. It's about who we are. And Father, I pray this morning that you pour your spirit out on each and every person that's listening to this video. That you prick their heart, that you, that you allow that mind to start working on your behalf. And I thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night he was to be betrayed, Jesus and